Hello everyone. This is going to be the first of a series of tutorials on the topic of templates. Uh, just to give you a warning ahead of time, there's going to be no real coding going on in this tutorial. I have Visual Studio open just to show you a little bit of syntax and function signatures, but we're not really going to be running any code this time. If you're very familiar with uh, templates, you might wish to just skip ahead. Uh, this tutorial is mostly going to be a bit of theory about why we want templates. Uh, even if you're already familiar with templates, it still could be useful to watch because it might make you think of it in a way that you didn't before and make you appreciate certain aspects of it uh, which you didn't think of before. So to start off, I'm just gonna throw out the word polymorphism. And when people think of polymorphism in C++, they tend to immediately think of inheritance. And when you have inheritance, they think of things like dogs and cats both inheriting from animal. And that's one type of polymorphism in C++, but there's actually four different types. So the other ones are templates, as you might have guessed. There's also overloading. And there's casting. And each of these forms of polymorphisms has a few uh, other names. So for casting, we can also call it coercion polymorphism. For overloading, we can also call it ad hoc polymorphism. Templates go by the name of uh, generics in some other languages. Um, you can also call it uh, compile time polymorphism. And you can also call it parametric polymorphism. And for inheritance, you could call it subtype polymorphism or runtime polymorphism uh, or dynamic polymorphism. So these are kind of like the casual or language specific names on the left side and on the right side are the more kind of uh, general names, right? So usually when you name things, there's kind of like the scientific name for it, and then there's a the way that people refer to it more casually. So the ones that I'm most interested in right now are ad hoc polymorphism and parametric polymorphism. So I'm a huge fan of studying words. So when somebody names something a certain way, there's generally a reason why they, they do that. So when you look at parametric polymorphism, just the word parametric, the word that stands out to you right away is parameter. It's very similar to parameter. And right away, that gives us a hint about what templates do. So when we have a template, one of the ideas is that the implementation of the template doesn't change. It's only the parameter that changes. And this is as opposed to ad hoc polymorphism. And it helps to know here that ad hoc is Latin, and it means for this. So what you can think of with overloading which you know to be, you have a lot of different functions with different signatures or different arguments, is that for this specific argument, I have a specific implementation. Right, so you can see how that contrasts right away with templates, where we keep the same implementation, it's only the parameter that changes. Right, so overloading is for each type of argument, I have a specific implementation. So, we want to then figure out when we want to use templates, what kind of problems they solve, and what kind of scenarios we run into where this parametric polymorphism comes into play. So when you think about where you use templates, two of the more common ones that you might run into are, let's say you have just vectors. And the other example I'm going to use is for sorting. And these are interesting because they show kind of the two cases where you tend to run into templates or the two different reasons why you need them. So if we pretend we live in a world without templates for a moment, right? So if you don't have templates, you can't write vector int, you can't write vector double, or you can't write vector foo, right? So you can't just have a vector for whatever type. So you basically have two kind of choices. The first choice is that you end up making a specific class for each type, right? So you have your vector int class and you have your vector double class and 
maybe they all inherit from the same base class, which is vector, right? So there'd be a, a, a base class which has the interface, and then you'd have the derive class which holds the, the data. Um, the second thing that you could do is you could use type erasure, and you could say, well, I have some vector, and inside the vector, it has a bunch of void pointers. So if you're not familiar with the concept of type erasure, again, if you study the, the name, type erasure does exactly what it sounds like. So strictly, uh, traditionally, when we think of C++, we think of having strong types. So with type erasure, you erase the type, right? So once you erase the type from something, like you have this void type, it has no type at all. And then what you can do once you have this erase type is you can do some sort of bookkeeping on your end and you can cast the type, uh, this void pointer to another type of pointer, right? So you can have a vector of void pointers and you can say, well, it's actually a vector of ints. And whenever I want to use one of these void pointers, I'll just cast it to an int pointer and I'll use it like that. But that's not exactly the nicest thing to do. And it kind of goes around the type system. So we prefer not to do that. The second case we have for templates, uh, you can kind of see it in the algorithms library. So if you actually look at the definition of sort, So the important part here is to note that it is a template. And if you're familiar with using sort, you give it two iterators for the range that you would like to sort, and then the predicate which does the sorting. And what's nice about these iterators is that it'll work with any container. Right? You don't need to specify the exact type. So then you have to wonder, OK, well, what can I do if I don't have templates? Right? How can I? sort these things without templates. And there's kind of two ways to go about it. So the first case is that if you look in the C standard library, you can find the function qsort. And if we look at the definition of qsort, you can see here that they're using this type erasure that I mentioned. So what you do with this qsort is you give a pointer to the first element you have, and you have to say how many elements there are. Right? So this is like kind of a traditional C uh, interface. So when I say C, I mean actual C, not C++, so just C. So you usually give it, so you're going to give it a pointer to the first element you want to sort. You tell it how many elements there are in total. And because you've erased the type, right? since this is just a void pointer, you don't have any information about the type. So you have to give it also the size of the elements. And then this is our predicate that we saw in the C++ sort. right? So this is a function pointer that is going to compare these elements to figure out how to sort them. So again, this interface is not kind of the nicest. It's uh, more prone to error, because if you get the number of elements wrong or the size of elements wrong, uh, it probably won't work. You probably get some kind of funny behavior. And you're also kind of limited in that all these elements have to be uh, contiguous. So they all have to be next to each other, right? Because we're starting in an element and we're just going to be moving over by the size of the element each time. So that's a kind of a limitation that you have that you didn't have in uh, the C++ sort where you can give it uh, an iterator to a map, for example, and you can go over the map even though the contents are not contiguous. So that's one option. But uh, the other option you might have is, well, you could make some sort of interface, which is the sortable interface, right? And then you could say, well, everybody who wants to be sortable could inherit from this interface. And then you could have some sort of a sort function, which takes a pointer to a sortable. And you can give it the number of items, I suppose. Right? So you could have something like uh, just count. And you could do something like that. And maybe that works, um, but there's a few problems with this. So the first problem that comes along, so let me just include vector here so I have some things that I would like. So the first problem comes when I have a vector of ints and let me put some that are not in order so we can actually say we want to sort this. And I would like to sort this now. So I'd like to give it to the sort function. So the problem is, well, these integers 
don't inherit from sort, sortable. Right? So they don't implement this interface. And because it's a primitive type, I don't have the option of making it inherit from sortable. So what you could do is you could make some sort of you know integer wrapper class. And it just contains an integer. And then you could say, well, my integer wrapper class to, uh, inherits from sortable. And maybe that could work. And if you look at other languages, I believe uh, Java has just an integer class. I'm not sure exactly what they use it for, but conceptually you could say, okay, well, this other language has it, so maybe we could do the same thing and we have certain reasons for wanting to do it. So then you could have uh, a vector of integers and you could say that the integer can be built from integers. All right, so then I can have this vector of integers that's just integer wrappers, and then I could sort them. And that also works. And the problem then comes along with, well, what if I have some, some function that's foo? And not only does it need things to be sortable, but it needs things to be equatable. All right, so sort as an interface usually requires that you have a way to compare things, usually with operator less than. And equatable, you want to check if two items are the same, usually with operator equal equals. So you have some sort of class that needs some sort of function that needs all its arguments to be both sortable and equatable. I'm not sure exactly what this function is doing, but let's say it's a requirement. So you could say, well, maybe I'll have some other interface that's sortable and equatable that inherits from sortable and it inherits from equatable and then foo could use this type uh, and again you can give it the count and it can do whatever and then we can make our vector of sortable and equatable and use this function foo then someone comes along and says well you know what I actually also need it to be uh, it needs to be fooable right we're just making up some sort of interface and it needs some other operation. And then you're like, okay, well, do I really want to make something that's, you know, sortable and equatable and foolable? And you kind of get into this combinatorics problem where you end up making like a huge number of interfaces. So we don't really like that either. So it turns out that making interfaces to try and solve this problem is not the best idea. What we really want are not things that are linked together through inheritance. We want just some things that share a common concept. And concepts are actually a C++ idea, uh, which are not implemented in the language uh, as of C++14. Uh, they also did not make it into C++17, but they'll come sometime in the future, maybe C++20 or whatever. And a concept is kind of like uh, an informal interface at the moment. So when you want to sort things, you have the concept of being less than comparable, right? Because we have this uh, operator less than that says whether one item should come before another. So there's a bunch of different concepts and we like our types to implement these concepts, but we don't want to force them as kind of type constraints, because when you have type constraints, then you have to kind of pass on these, you have to deal with these types everywhere else in the system, and you don't really want to do that. So those are kind of our two cases for what polymorphism solves, right? So the first case, as with vector, is a case where the type doesn't matter, right? So a vector never really asks any information about the type that it's containing. It'll add items of that type, it can remove items of that type, uh, but it never needs to know specific details of the type. So it's kind of this special case where you can change just the parameter and the implementation doesn't change. The second scenario was, is where we have types that need to share a common concept but are not really related in terms of their types. 
Right? So when you talk about sortable, you might want to sort absolutely anything. That doesn't mean that everything should share the same inheritance hierarchy, right? You don't want your dogs to be sortable and your cars to be sortable as an interface that they inherit because everything is sortable and you don't want to make this type that absolutely everything needs to implement because it turns out then I would need all my types to implement all these interfaces and it just doesn't work out. So this is the end of this first section and in the further tutorials we'll look at some examples of using templates. Thanks for watching.